Miracy. It's the values held by the people who start the company and then the people that join the company that shape the day-to-day -day behaviors. And those day-to-day -day behaviors are what define the culture. Culture isn't, you know, ping pong tables and free meals. Although some people like those a lot, culture is how we work together when no one's looking, when no one's telling us. I'm Sharon Richmond, and this is To Lead as Human. For more than 30 years, I've run a business called Leading Large, helping C-level executives have greater impact. We partner to clarify their priorities, energize their organizations, and build cultures of accountability and respect. In this podcast, we highlight ways you can supercharge your leadership by introducing you to real-life executives who have intentionally built organizations in which their leadership, the bottom line, and their employees all thrive. These successful business leaders demonstrate the principles of leading large. They know that as leaders, the power that comes with their position requires an equal measure of responsibility to their customers, employees, shareholders, and communities. In each episode, we have the chance to learn from the challenges and successes they've experienced on their leadership journey. Today's episode is our season two finale, and we're shaking things up a bit for you, our listeners. So we're turning the tables to give you a chance to learn a little more about me. And today, rather than being the interviewer, I'll be the interviewee. And at the end, I'll share some key takeaways from all of season two. I'd like to introduce you all to Ari Eni. I've known Ari for nearly five years and I've participated in many masterminds with him where I've clarified my own business priorities and thought through how my team and I deliver on our promises to our clients. Ari knows me very well. And so I thought he'd be the perfect interviewer for today. Ari is also the director of growth at Miracy and the co-host of Course Lab, another show in the Miracy FM podcast network. Okay, Ari, I'm at your mercy. Take it away. Thank you, Sharon. I'm really happy to be here and I'm looking forward to interviewing you. I'm really excited about this. So let's get started. So you've been coaching top executives for more than 30 years. And I'm really curious, as you know, you've been working with these kinds of executives, what was your journey leading to this? Okay, I'm going to start long, long ago and far away with my young life, really when I was a teenager. The first woman I ever met who ran a business was a friend of my mother's, and I thought she was the most elegant, accomplished, amazing woman. And I just became kind of fascinated with the idea of a business way back then, so maybe 12 or 13. And then around that same time, I was freakishly fascinated by how people grow and evolve over time. So long before I even went to college, I used to go over to the library, the undergraduate library at Duke University, which is where my dad worked. And he would let me in on a Saturday when he went to the lab to go do whatever. And I would go into the stacks and I would read case studies of psychological cases. But from that very early time, I just have always been just really fascinated by what do we go through as individuals as we grow and develop? And as I became older, I started to have that fascination, not just with the individuals, but also with how organizations might grow and change. And fast forward quite a lot of years, I studied developmental psych as an undergrad and decided, no, I wasn't going to be a therapist. That was not going to be a path I would enjoy. But I was kind of bit with the personal development bug, I guess one could say. And so after I got out of college, I worked in a battered women's shelter program through the VISTA volunteer organization. I learned a lot about sitting with people struggling, and we had training in peer counseling from early on. And also I ran the fundraising arm of this not-for-profit in Nevada. And one of the highlights was hosting a fundraising event at the governor's mansion in Carson City, Nevada. And so this combination of like people and money always just really generates smiles for me. I can't say why. You know, I grew up in a medical family, so I didn't know a lot of business people. And so I just kind of got this fascination with business. And after I had moved out to the Bay Area in my early 20s, 
you know, it was a very deep recession at the time and whatever job I could find, I was taking. And eventually I ended up finding a mentor at the business that I had taken this like cashier's job at, who kind of coached and guided me into some more senior positions to where I eventually became manager of quite a large group of people at a very young age. It's like 120 students who were working part-time at this college bookstore. And I learned an awful lot about managing people, giving feedback, setting expectations, all kinds of basic, I'll say, management block and tackle. So that's all of the backdrop, which through a range of things took me to business school at Stanford. And there I really doubled down on my passion about organizational behavior and organization change and how strategy and organization change were so inexorably linked. So that was really the joy of my studies when I was in business school. And anything about strategy or organizations plus cost accounting, which you know is the language of business. So I had to take some great advanced cost accounting classes with towering giants in the field. I'll just say that. And so I learned the language of business to blend it together with the language of behavior change. And that kind of got me off and running. And so from there, how did you get to coaching? And was there an interim step? So when I got out of business school, I love to say I was an accidental consultant, and it's completely true. I had no intention of going out and finding independent consulting gigs. And this was back in the 80s, so it wasn't like today where gig work is like all the thing. But I found an opportunity to work with a very, very experienced coach and organization development specialist at the Northern California Utility Company. And I was an apprentice to her for several years, during which time I helped run a project with a lot of analytical support, and she taught me how to be a coach. And I began my coaching career really around, I want to say, 1989 or 90. It was a long time ago, before there were a lot of coaching programs. So Retha Wellens is her name, and she taught me how to listen how to hold space, what kinds of questions would invite discovery on the part of the managers that I was coaching. And from there, I ended up going back into, I like to call it straight MBA consulting, which is strategy, cost analysis, operational effectiveness, just the basics of what the large consulting firms do. So I had several years in that training ground, which helped to cement the business side. And then I joined a program to train people how to be facilitators of a structure called T-groups. So this is part of a, a class that's actually taught at Stanford Graduate School of Business. It's called Interpersonal Dynamics. And the way the class works, it's a small class, 36 students broken into three groups of 12. And it's essentially the lab portion of this discovery class, which is fondly called touchy-feely by the students at the school. And it's been one of the most popular classes at the business school for, I want to say, 50 years. Well, the one touchy-feely class, so. <laughs> so it's a leaderless learning group. So again, doubling down on all those core skills that build excellent coaching, listening, understanding the levels of development, individual, like intra-psychic, me growing inside myself interpersonal, like you and I getting to be able to relate better to each other, and group level, which talks about how do you create safety in a group and build collaboration. For more than 20 years, I've done these. I've facilitated these groups. And I think that was the cementing of my core coaching skills. And from there, I continued to work more and more with organizations that needed to make their way through some changes in order to implement their strategies. And I'm assuming that over time, as you've worked more and more with people, also the types of people that you've worked with have become more and more senior. And so I'm really curious as to the difference in working with the different levels of the organization, both for you and the kinds of challenges that people face at those different levels. That's a good question. So working with anyone in middle management is different because they're in this thermal layer kind of squeeze between what the executives want and what the hands-on folks can do or will do. And trying to 
navigate that sense of, well, how much authority do I have? Which decisions can I make? And which ones do I have to get approval for? So there's a lot of dilemmas. And then I think as you're moving out of individual contributor into manager, there's an alliance and allegiance that is often felt to those frontline employees. So somewhere along the way, you have to grapple with, am I going to be friends with the people I manage or not? How do I build safety and closeness without stepping over the line in a way that would make it harder to give the kind of guidance and direction needed. At the executive level, the challenges are kind of the opposite, right? You're not very close. Even in a small company, you lose touch with the front line more quickly. So there's a difference between large company executives and small company executives. Large company executives, they fit in a hierarchical structure, and there are more rules and expectations. You have to figure it out. It's not always spelled out for you, but it's always there before you get there. And so you're bringing your cultural background into whatever company you join. And that, I think, is a challenge. How can you appreciate and value the culture you're entering while also recognizing that you may have been brought in to effect some changes? So in smaller companies, the executive challenges, I think, tend to be a little more around allocating decision authority and getting comfortable with other people being more knowledgeable at and better at running parts of the business than you can ever be as a C-level. You have a perspective. Of course, you get the big picture, but you don't always see the day-to-day. The nitty-gritty little pieces that are just invisible from that view. And because as people rise in organizations, position power accrues to them, and the positional power difference can become greater than a leader realizes very quickly. I have a client I've been working with for the last several years who came from quite a large, very successful tech company. And he's been working at this amazing startup, doing fabulous work. And when I started working with him, he was just frustrated that the team under him in this 35-person organization couldn't move as strategically and as thoughtfully and as quickly as he could. He had been managing and leading people very senior, and now he had a very junior team. I think it surprised him how different it was, what he could realistically expect, and how he would need to adapt his ability to coach these more junior folks in his group. And it's not easy when you're high-energy high-powered executive and you like to drive for action and someone says, I don't understand or can you slow down? It's like, but I don't want to slow down. We're supposed to be speeding up. Exactly. I feel like people learn a lot about you through the perspective that you bring in the conversations that you have on your amazing show. And I feel like it's still snippets. So I'm curious, what are the stages of business or the level of the executives that you've had the most success with? And what did that actually look like? So I've been doing this kind of work now for close to four decades, not quite. So that means I've worked with people at lots of levels in many different sizes of business. Over the last 10 to 12 years, I decided that I could narrow further. And so I primarily work with senior executives most often C-level, of mid-sized companies and smaller companies. I live in the heart of Silicon Valley, so often startups, sometimes venture-backed, sometimes not. And then because the consulting work I did early in my career was specific in the healthcare industry, and I spent quite a few years working in that industry, I also have a subset of physician executives that I coach, who, of course, went through training to become physicians, but really never learned how to manage a division or a department or to collaborate with others or to lead large-scale change or any of the kinds of things we work on. I think they are almost always very eager to learn people. They just love learning. They generally see something that's happening and they don't like it or they're disappointing themselves in some way with how they're leading or they're stuck in an area where they just need a thought partner to kind of tease apart the issues and lay out a plan. Are those the kinds of traits 
in a way that you see in successful executives, executives that are able to push companies to growth and build amazing teams and kind of do all the great things that a good executive could do? I think yes. I mean, there's more to it. One of the mantras that I suggest, particularly to CEOs, but to many of my clients, is to carry in their head this idea of showing up as calm, capable, and curious. And the reason for that is if you're going to effectively lead an organization, you can't be creating chaos. Having clarity and providing clarity to your organization is essential in order that people know what to work on and how to prioritize their work. So that's the calm and focused piece. The capable is we all have self-doubts. I don't know anybody who doesn't have a voice inside saying, who am I to think I can do this? Or, oh my gosh, I'm in way over my head. Or, you know, I've had several guests say, finally, I just had to say to myself, well, if they think I'm good enough to do it, I must be. And having the ability to hold and know yourself to be capable and thoughtful telegraphs credibility and it telegraphs safety and peace to people. So again, you're calm, you're capable, you signal that you know what you're doing, even though you don't have all the answers. And that's the curious part, right? And for curious, there, you have to stop being in charge of everything and learn how to spread the decision authority, spread the accountability, and step back a little bit so that others can rise to lead. So something that you've been talking about more in the last couple episodes of the podcast that I really appreciate is that there is a learning edge that a good executive is clear that they still have a learning edge and are still on the path. Always. I mean, I can't imagine stopping growing. I can't imagine not being interested in learning something new, being somehow continuing to grow and to contribute some kind of value to the communities that we're part of. So the balance between having confidence in your ability to think through problems at a higher, more complex level is different than just saying, oh, I can do anything. I'm not talking about the kind of capable where it's, I've got all the answers, just do what I say at all. And that's why I think the curiosity becomes important. It's because you can't possibly know everything you need to know as one person, even at the top of an organization, maybe especially. So if you're not humble enough to be open to hearing other people's ideas, no matter where their ideas come from, then you're probably going to miss out on some important things. And I think there's another complexity that comes to this, you know, advancing into the C-suite. Deb Grunfeld at Stanford does research on the disinhibition that comes along with increased power. And people start to think they're not subject to the same rules, norms that everyone else is. So it takes a fair amount of humility to recognize when your ego is telling you how awesome you are and kind of better than everyone else. And you have to remember different, but perhaps not better. Smart, but perhaps not smarter. Right. It's interesting because, you know, a humble CEO is not in a way sounds like it's an oxymoron just based on culture, but shouldn't be. Well, and that's part of why I started this podcast in the first place. The kinds of leaders that make the covers of popular press and make the news, so to speak, they're not always, I'll just say, regular people who are doing great work. So I just wanted to make those stories so much more available. And that's why I look for executives who are running successful companies financially, but are also building those companies with this sense of, I want to have a culture where people feel respected and valued and excited to bring their very best all the time. And the only way I know to do that from my own experience leading in organizations is to have this kind of culture that encourages personal accountability, but also has just deep human respect for everyone, no matter what the level of their position. You're saying that you really enjoy working with leaders of organizations that have an understanding around, you know, the kinds of organizations that they want to build. But again, the humility to understand that it may not be where they really want it to be yet and that they may or may not have the skills to get it there. And so that's where getting that outside support can be really crucial to shortcut that process and really support the organization. Absolutely. 
And that's humility and curiosity put together, right? I can see it's not going quite where I want it to. What can I do differently? How can I think differently? It's part of how I got so interested in the shaping culture work, because at least from the way that I approach work in organizations, it's the values held by the people who start the company and then the people that join the company that shape the day-to-day -day behaviors. And those day-to-day -day behaviors are what define the culture. Culture isn't ping pong tables and free meals, although some people like those a lot. I don't mind a free meal myself once in a while, but that's not culture. Culture is how we work together when no one's looking, when no one's telling us. And that, to me, is essential to the heart of a company. It's part of why employees feel attached and connected and what drives longevity and also fulfills a sense of purpose. And I can't see why only executives and senior leaders should have a sense of purpose fulfilled by their work. I mean, if it's not across the board, then I feel like the organization won't be doing nearly as well as it could. And I think we've got lots of examples to bear that out. And similarly, we have examples of companies where the belief that the way we treat our employees is the way they will treat our customers plays out beautifully. So I find it a good principle to treat everybody in a way that they feel respected and important. Awesome. So as you very well know, the listeners of the show do like hearing you get personal with your guests. And so I'd like to dive into possibly a challenge that you've had along your leadership path and kind of how you worked through it and how you came out kind of on the other end better for going through it. It's a good question. So I had this retail management position when I was quite young, and I did that for about four or five years. And then after business school, I had a lot of consulting experience. So I, you know, like a lot of leaders started out managing teams and more junior people. And I'm sure I had all the same problems that everyone else has, you know, either being too friendly or being too demanding or thinking I was smarter than. It took me a while as a young manager to come to the understanding that my opinion was not actually always right or the most important one. And it's hard because if you're, as I am, one of these very accomplishment-oriented people who grew up in a family that was like, go out, do, be, make it great. You know, we have so much reinforcement in our young lives for being smart and the best and winning and getting rewards and setting another goal and tackling that goal that it's a shock to the system. It was a shock to my system. The first time someone, a mentor said to me, do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? And it blew me out of the water because, duh, of course, we want to be effective. And yet a lot of my behaviors were pushing as if it was more important to me to be right. And that wasn't my intention, but that's how it came across. And so it led to some tough feedback. Sure. I learned that I was perceived as intimidating or arrogant, which again, that was not part of my self-concept. And those are hard things to hear. And honestly, I am not at all ashamed to say I went through years of therapy to figure out for myself who did I want to be and what did I care about and how did I want to work and how did I want to be at work. Now, I don't think that therapy is the only way to get there. And obviously, as a coach, I work with lots of people on that journey, but I had some other things I needed to sort out. And it's important to know that too. And once I was able to do that, then as I took on leadership roles, I was always super excited by the challenge so I worked at Stanford Business School for quite a while, helping to develop leadership programs, interactive, experientially based programs. And that was great. But I got recruited away from there to go to Cisco Systems, which is a big tech company. The woman who recruited me said, we know we're not good at change. We just can't figure out why. And we want someone to come help figure this out. And I could not turn down that challenge. I just couldn't. It was too juicy. So I joined the company. I was there for a little over three years. And during that time, we figured out that part of the root cause of this challenge was that the leaders in the company didn't understand their role in leading these large-scale changes. And so you could say just kind of a little old-fashioned in the approach of, here's the change we're making. Here's the schedule to roll it out. Okay, guys, go roll it out, which is not a strategy that works well. And especially not with tech rollouts. And everybody now knows this, but this was quite a number of years ago. So I got a lot of feedback. You know, I was hired to be a change agent. And so right away I got pushback that I wasn't respecting the culture, that I wasn't respecting the norms. And that was painful 
and hard to hear. And one of my bosses offered to engage a coach for me. So I had a great coach I worked with for about six months, sorting out how could I be effective without creating the pushback that might lead to resistance that I didn't want. And that coach was tremendously helpful. I do a lot of work with the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator and always have. And we had a practitioner come in and do a team building with my team there. And during that debrief, I learned that I had inadvertently been hurting somebody's feelings that I really respected because I just didn't understand how she was interpreting something I was doing or saying. And it was hard. These are hard things because in a leadership role, at least for me, I feel like it's the shepherd, right? My job is to make it easier for everyone else to get the right stuff done. And I was making it harder. So that was humbling too. And even though feedback is very hard to hear sometimes, I do truly believe that it is most often a gift. If it's given in the spirit of learning and growing, I do receive it as a gift. It took a while. I used to be really defensive, like a lot of people when they first start getting feedback. But, you know, again, learning how to manage my own emotions, contain the defensiveness and try to move into that curious place, I think is what helped me learn and grow from those experiences. So the way I see it, coaches are leaders in themselves, like to the people that they are coaching and working with. And so in your capacity as a coach, what is a challenge that you've had recently that you've learned and grown from? The hardest thing for me as a coach is working with someone who loses interest in their own development. And I can sometimes take it really personally. And I did have someone I was working with not that long ago in the last few years and they would show up to their sessions. Everything's good. Here are all the things that are great. What would you like to focus on today? I don't really know. I don't really have anything. And this would go on week after week. And as a coach, I like to be direct, but also kind. And so I had to figure out how to say to this client, I don't think you're making the most of our time together. So tell me if you're done, why don't we be finished? Right. And if you're not done, and there's some things we can work on. Let's figure out what those are. Because I don't think it's a good use of either of our time to continue on not making significant progress. So that's hard because when I'm at my best as a coach is when I can hold the person I'm working with. This is going to sound super weird in pure love to be able to feel that person to person love that says, I believe in you. I hear you. I see you. I can validate what you're saying to me. And I can also think with you if this is really the way you want to be or if there are changes you want to make. And if I can't find that place of real love, I don't like it <laughs> and I don't do as well. And I think as a coach, you know this. So it can be really hard. And that I think is for me, that's the hardest thing because I'm tough on myself like everyone is. I think I should be able to find that feeling with anybody and not everybody is a good fit. So accepting that and accepting what that might mean, it's a hard thing. But I prefer to have clients that are resonant than dissonant. 100%. And creating that clarity for yourself, absolutely. So the last question that we have, you've asked many, many guests what the title of this podcast means to them. So I would like to know, and I'm sure all of your listeners would love to know, what does to lead as human, what does that mean to you? So... To me, it means every one of us is a leader in some ways if we choose to be. And I genuinely do believe that leaders are developed, not born. My daughter has this amazing gift of being able to read other people's emotions. I had to work really hard to develop that capability, but I did. And even though it didn't come as naturally to me in the beginning, I think I'm pretty good at it now. And there's a second part to it, which is we are fallible as human beings. We can never not be fallible. And so saying to lead as human is a way of saying, it's okay to mess up. It's okay not to be perfect. It's okay to get help. It's okay to try new things. It's human. It's part of our experience. We are communal animals. We don't have sharp teeth, strong claws, lots of ferocious power to protect ourselves from the elements and predators, what we have is the ability to band together to create things bigger than any one of us can create. And so to me, that's all about being human. And I long have believed, it might be Pollyanna, but I don't care. 
I believe business can be a really tremendous force for good in the world. I think it should be. And so it's just human to try to figure out how do we gather people together toward a bigger, better outcome. I really appreciate that perspective and that approach. And in turn, you hosting this podcast and bringing more of that message out to the world because I feel like leaders need to be hearing that in order to become better leaders and better people, to be honest, and better humans. If you're a better human, you're a better leader. That is for sure. So as we wrap up, Sharon, what's one bit of advice that you'd like to share with your listeners so that they can be more successful leaders and build the workplaces that are really more fully human? I think I would like leaders to recognize that what is important in their role is far simpler than they think. To provide clarity for the organization, to understand how to build up the energy in the human system of the organization so that we've got some energy to spend on these great pursuits we're going to do. And this is the hard one, not to solve people's problems, but to enable them to solve their problems better themselves. And so coaching and developing others to be more self-sufficient, to be more collaborative. I know those can sound in opposition, but I don't believe they are. I think this is what leaders do. They create the conditions under which organizations thrive and human beings, the people there, thrive and customers thrive and investors thrive. So if we can pull it all together and if leaders can remember, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. You don't have to have the best strategic idea. You have to listen and learn, but you don't have to be the be all and end all. Your job is to cultivate the environment for excellence. And if you want a hand, there are lots and lots of people in the world who want to help. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sharon, for asking me to do this. Oh, Ari, thank you so much for doing it. It's a little nerve wracking. So I have a little more empathy for my guests. And it's also joyful to have the time to stop and really reflect on what matters to me. And so thank you so much for guiding our dialogue today. It was absolutely my pleasure. I always enjoy our conversations. I always learn so much from hearing you and kind of the way that you think and approach things. And myself as a leader, I take your words as, you know, lessons to breathe in, to sit with, and to really embrace. So I really appreciate, of course, you bringing me in to have this conversation with you and just everything that you put out into the world. You make the world a better place. So thank you. Thank you, Ari. Same to you, my friend. Thank you. And Sharon... What's the best way for listeners to find you and see what you're up to? Well, as everybody who listens knows, you can go to my website, Leading Large, which I will spell for you in a few minutes. You can also reach me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active. I love to share resources and ideas with people and build connections and relationships with folks. And that's my favorite venue for that. Or you can just listen to this podcast. And to everyone who is listening, I highly recommend that you do reach out to Sharon. She is awesome. And any conversation that you have with her will be well worth the time. Please stay with us for a few moments. I'll share some themes that emerged from season two's interviews. Listening back over the last 12 episodes or so, I was really struck by how consistent some of the themes are across our guests, regardless of their age, experience level, or even the kind of organization they lead. I've mentioned before a leadership model that I developed about 15 years ago and that I use with clients still. A client once called it the world's simplest leadership model. I don't know if that's true, but I am a fan of simple, although not necessarily easy. So let me use this as a framework to summarize the season takeaways. As a reminder, the three things leaders must do according to this model are set clear direction, engage and inspire people, and enable brilliant execution. So starting with that clarity of direction, Geetha Morali told us, leaders light a path for others and described how important it is to be always aware of that. Her own leadership guidelines, walk the talk, stay humble, live your values, be bold with organization goals, have clear non-negotiables, communicate, communicate, communicate. Eliana Hassan shared almost identical principles. Sharon Vosmeck 
leads unapologetically and provides such clarity, speaking widely to her intention, her values, her desired outcomes for the company, and she personally embodies the Astia mission fully. Maureen O'Connor focuses on providing clarity also, and she highlighted clarity of goals, values, governance, and purpose, as well as what your cultural expectations are of the people in the organization. Several of our guests, Doug Campbelljohn, Rachel Masiris, Marissa Levers, all mentioned the importance of defining your culture clearly and how it differentiates your organization from others. Cultivating community to build mutual commitment was mentioned, along with creating memorable moments about values discussions, and courtesy of Mitch Joel, promoting what he called a knives-out culture, meaning we turn against our competitors, not against each other. Moving to the second must-do, engage and inspire people, quite a few of our guests emphasized how important it is to be intentional, stating the why of your goals, meeting each employee as an individual, learning about them, and building trust by being authentic and even by sharing some vulnerabilities. Tim Lupinacci defines the leadership standards in his organization that encourage a focus on people first. And Doug Campbelljohn describes building a strong culture that encourages employees to bond with their coworkers, even in early stage startups, as a leader taking small actions that will build trust and connection, like asking someone what's most fun to them about their work, or even if they're having fun. Another topic frequently mentioned that has to do with engaging and inspiring people is the importance of including a wide range of people in discussions and decision-making. This is because including multiple perspectives helps us see what's outside our own field of view. One way John Abbott includes others is to ask them to join together and complete an exercise, finishing the sentence, if only we could. He especially finds this helpful if employees are seeing more limitations than opportunities. Dev Basu reminded us that we have to be open to learning from everyone, as we never know what we don't know or what we can't see from our own vantage point. This kind of inclusivity isn't just a DEIB, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging strategy. It actually improves decision-making quality, according to several academic studies. That third obligation of leaders is to ensure the organization can deliver on its promises operationally. I call it enabling brilliant execution. John Abbott, I'll turn to him again, sums this up by saying, leaders create the conditions for others to thrive. Keeping all the folks engaged, including folks when he quoted himself as saying, when the clay is still wet, which I really love, and telling stories about early wins until they bore you to death and until others are tired of hearing them. Then lastly, embracing the resistance you may encounter along the way, being curious about every concern that someone raises, Hidden in those concerns might be just the secret to your implementation success. Delegation, when and how to do it, was mentioned often, both in connection with developing others and in recognizing that as you become more senior, you can't and you shouldn't be doing all the things that you know how to do and are good at. The more senior you are, the more you must delegate wisely, coaching until you're confident to delegate and including decision authority to maintain the momentum of your organization's delivery. Lastly, I highlight Miranda Lever's analogy about deciding and helping others decide which fires to let burn. She describes looking around and seeing lots of little fires and a few big ones, one of which she says is existential and we have to all work together to snuff it out, versus some other smaller fires that may be troubling now but not yet problematic can be monitored and managed for some period of time. I find this a terrific analogy for making sure your people are aligned to the top priorities without getting bogged down by every small challenge they encounter. And if you missed Liam Martin's episode, Liam introduced us to an entirely new perspective about how to manage asynchronously. It certainly won't work for all leaders or all organizations, but as he points out, success using that model requires a few things total transparency of information, self-directed people, and clearly defined processes supported by a tech platform. So there are some good takeaways that talk about the three major things leaders need to do, make sure they're bringing clarity and energy 
and effective delivery to their organizations. There are quite a number of self-development lessons that our guests shared as well, which I will summarize shortly in a blog post. But I would be seriously remiss if I didn't mention the one thing that almost every leader raised, the importance of knowing yourself, your values, your needs, and of taking care of yourself, not just your organization. If you need a stark reminder, just return to the episode where Andy Levitt from Purple Carrot describes his near-death experience. Truly inspirational and also a wake-up call. There is nothing more important than you taking care of yourself as the leader. You're a human being, and it's really important that you prioritize your physical, mental, psychological, and spiritual well-being so that you can lead in a way that makes you proud of yourself. I'm Sharon Richmond, and this has been To Lead as Human. You can find out more about me at leadinglarge.com. That's L-E-A-D-I-N-G, large.com. To Lead as Human is part of the Miracy FM podcast network, which also includes such shows as Soul Savvy Business and Making It. This episode was produced by Cynthia Lamb. Marvin Del Rosario edited it, and Danny Eney is our executive producer. So you don't miss any upcoming episodes. You can follow us on Mira CFM's YouTube channel or on your favorite podcast player, which might be where you're listening today. I have two requests. First, did you learn something useful today? Jot it down in a review and star it and let everybody know what you learned so they can listen too. And second, think of one colleague that you could share this podcast with. Because the more leaders that can really think about how to lead from our human core, the better leadership will become all the way around. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next time on To Lead is Human.